Welcome to season three of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I speak to Professor Daryl Gaskin, a health economist at Johns Hopkins, about life expectancy in the United States before, during, and after the pandemic. Let's listen. Professor Gaskin, thank you so much for joining me. Um, You were part of a committee of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine that just wrote a report called High and Rising Mortality Rates Among Working Age Adults. What problem was this report describing? Well, um, it's a real crisis in, in America. Over the last 30 years, our um, mortality rates have been rising relative to our peer countries. Meaning, so if you sort of look at a trend of of life expectancy for our country relative to our European peers, Japan, um, you'll see that from say the 50s to the 70s and 80s, we were sort of tracking along with them. And then after that, as we get into the 90s, we really start to slow down and they continue to continue to rise. And uh, now we're here in 2020, where we're actually seeing declines in life expectancy. And, uh, and so something is happening in the United States that's not happening in the rest of the world. And the problem seems to be focused among working age adults. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's, that's absolutely um, correct. And it's... it's um, we, what we're seeing is those persons between 25 and, and 64 that they're they're dying uh, relatively young, and um, and there are three sort of main causes here. Um, one is that we're seeing a, a certainly a rise in uh, drug and alcohol poisoning. Uh, second, we're seeing a rise in um, suicide, and third, we're seeing a rise in uh, uh, deaths due to uh, cardio. Uh, metabolic diseases. Um, so it's... The, those are three big problems. Yeah. You know, the, the, the overdose crisis, which includes opioids, but also methamphetamine and other uh, drugs, um, alcohol, um, that has been on the radar and yet is still getting worse. Yeah, absolutely. When we when we think about the the drug and, and uh, alcohol problem, it starts in the in the mid '90s with with legal opioids. But then once we get into the the mid uh, 2000s and into 2010s, and the illegal um, opioids just hit hit our markets, and uh, unfortunately. There are uh, a lot of availability for these drugs have been uh, increased, as well as there's a, a, a large swath of our population that are vulnerable in terms of they have some, some underlying conditions that, that make them susceptible to, to using these substances. And then you have uh, suicide, which has also continued to get worse. And particularly, I read in the report, um, rural areas are seeing big increases in suicide. Yeah, um, it's, it's, in some ways, it's, it's some of the same factors that have made um, uh, this population vulnerable to uh, drug use has also made them vulnerable to suicide. So we see suicides increase for, with related to firearms. But we also see suicides increase with, with other means of, of, that people use to kill themselves. And we think it has something to do with the eroding of, of sort of economic opportunities for these individuals, as well as uh, the crumbling of sort of the social fabric. So uh, communities that 
that where we're seeing high um, levels of sort of family um, dissolutions, um, so low levels of social support. Um, and it's, it's, it's really a, quite a crisis. And it's, it's um, in those places where, in a real sense, the uh, job opportunities for people who have a high school diploma or less have just really just bottomed out in this country. And it's having a, a real um, negative impact on on uh, those individuals. And so, so some people have called this the deaths of despair between overdose and suicide. Um, and I've talked about these underlying structural causes. Did you find evidence for that as one part of the problem here? So we, we um, with regard to the sort of like the terminology death of despair. So deaths of despair is really like a, a it's a journalistic term. So what happened is, is some journalists looked at these collection of, of diseases and said, wow, this is this has to do this is in connection with hopelessness and people sort of uh, reacting and trying to self-medicate and so forth like that. So in terms of the evidence that tries to link these things to despair, particularly uh, the scientific evidence is not is not as strong. We do know that there is some um, linkage to whether or not people are optimistic about the future. So um, 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 whites in in this country have become less optimistic about the future, less hopeful about the future, and especially in those places where we see high um, um, mortality rates. Um, But... um, 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 one of the things in which we recommend in our report is that we really need to, to sort of really investigate this notion of hopelessness from out of a sort of a, a more of a, a, a psychological um, um, framework in the sense that there are ways in which we can try to measure these things and really figure out whether people are really, it's whether it's hopelessness or is it just that we just have to um, uh, the, our environment has changed too much so that it's making people more at risk of either using drugs or... or I see. Um, so the terminology deaths of despair may individualize this a little bit more than mm-hmm, yeah. the evidence really suggests. It could be that there are these social disruptions that are leading to both overdose and suicide. Right, right, right. And, and, and one of the things in which um, uh, we really... Um, wanted to put a a lot of emphasis on is that um, the obesogenic environment, so the food environment, the, the, because the obesity rates in our country have just been continued to rise throughout this period. And, and so when we're, when we see the cardio um, metabolic diseases increasing and deaths associated with them, you know, it's, it's what's underlying that is the fact that, uh, as a country, we're we're becoming more overweight and more obese, and 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 in some sense, we we have to figure out a way in which to to do something about that if we're going to stem the tide. Um, yeah, it's it's more complicated than just overdose and suicide. There's something very serious going on with cardio metabolic health. Mm-hmm, absolutely, and one of the things that that, that we saw in particular. Is so we we've had um, some decline in in heart disease, right? Um, but it stagnates like at, at around the mid two two hundred, I mean two thousands into twenty ten, the the declines start to stagnate, and so we don't see the declines anymore. And but then we see the rise in these other diseases that are related to obesity, like di- like diabetes. Diabetes would be an example. Mm-hmm, absolutely. I'd like to circle back to a, a comment you made that I think particularly it may have been overdose or suicide was spiking in the white community. And d- did this report look at the life expectancy trends for different races and ethnicities? Uh, yeah. So one of the reasons why the report is called High and Rising is because um, for African Americans and Native Americans, the mortality rates are, are higher um, consistently throughout the period relative to to whites, uh, non-Hispanics, and and so we we 
um, in some ways, we want to try to, one, acknowledge that and to also um, try to explain that. One of the things in uh, hypotheses that we, we, we posit is, is that a lot of the erosion of the, the labor market and a family for low-skill, low-income um, um, Blacks uh, occurred during the 1970s and 80s. And so some of the, the, the um, um, terrible uh, things that with regard to, to drug use um, that were that were prevalent in that time just happened to inner city communities earlier relative. And so first it hits inner city um, committees, uh, communities in the, the late 80s. Um, and and then subsequently, then we see this drug problem and it, it sort of migrates, if you will, to um, um, uh, sort of rural America at the communities that were dependent upon manufacturing and mining for their jobs. And as those jobs leave and those, the fabric of those, those communities change, then we see uh, the same type of phenomena. So it, in a sense, the report is a more coherent explanation of these trends in different groups rather than saying these recent trends are just affecting one group. Absolutely. And the other thing that's in the report that we notice is that so we see the the drug um, poisonings um, primarily in the 1990s and the early 2000s impacting whites. But then by the time the drug the drug uh, phenomenon is first, it's legal drugs with opioids being treated for for a pain that's not associated with cancer. And then um, subsequently it becomes heroin and fentanyl. When the, when the problem becomes heroin and fentanyl, then we see it starting to affect um, Black and Hispanic communities. Um, um, and it's, it's, it's really a, a quite a, you know, it's just a terrible problem. Yeah, this is a crisis of American health with important racial dimensions. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, and all of this research is before COVID, Right. I mean, COVID comes on top of this, you yeah, know, yeah. knocking down American life expectancy and actually, you know, expanding the already profound disparities that exist between races and ethnicities in the United States. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And and the um, I mean, COVID sort of exploits uh, some of the um, the disparities that we we have with regard to um housing, employment, uh, and access to medical care, and then one's ability to, to minimize risk. But even, I mean, hopefully and prayerfully, we will um, uh, be able to move through this pandemic. Um, but then even after we move through the pandemic, the underlying causes of why people are dying young in the United States still remain. I mean, we still are gonna have a problem with regard to um, drug poisonings, suicides, and these cardio um, metabolic diseases. Right. Yeah, I mean, one way to think about COVID is that it can exploit all three of those, right? COVID separates mm-hmm. people, gives makes people uh, lonely, not good mm-hmm. for overdoses and suicides, and then COVID directly affects people who are obese in, yeah. in a way that you know, directly increases their risk of mortality. And so these trends that have existed for a couple decades really um, really put us in a poor position for this pandemic. And, and beyond, like you pointed out, COVID certainly hasn't uh, helped and we're going to be dealing with these larger trends well past COVID. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, fortunately, this report uh, Dr. Gaskin um, didn't end with a description of the problem. Right? That's correct. There, there are a whole bunch of ideas in here, and um, I wanted maybe to give you a chance to talk about a few of them, like critical policy steps that you think, if if this is a moment for us to reinvest in health, these things have to be on the agenda. What, what would you put on that agenda? Well, um, so there are some some downstream policies, so policies that are associated, that are direct um, um, and really proximal to the problem. So things like 
Uh, Medicaid expansion. Why expand Medicaid? Because people who are low income, who need access to uh, medical care, who need access to, to care with regard to treatment, if they have an addiction problem, they need um, health insurance and Medicaid's a primary payer for that and will pay for that. Um, Problems, uh, to, uh, interventions that are designed to help um, our youth and young adults not become obese. So um, all those those uh, sort of local interventions, community-based interventions that are designed to um, improve both the food environment as well as people's level of, of physical activity. Um, regulations with regard to uh, um, uh, opioids and, and both on the legal side, and then uh, problems dealing with uh, the importation of fentanyl and, and heroin are, are things in which we need to do. So those are things that are downstream. But then we need to go upstream because there are communities that are suffering economically. And, and so we need to have policies that try to help revive uh, communities so that people who are high school earn uh, have a high school diploma can actually earn uh, a livable wage and and have meaningful um, 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 career opportunities and and that's uh, as, as that's something which has crumbled over the last thirty years which really needs to be um, uh, rebuilt um, um, and and what about can you just talk for a second about the the upstream issues that relate to the significant disparity by race, ethnicity in, in uh, life expectancy? Well, the other thing that we, we need to do is, is try to um, really, I mean, we're in this moment where everyone has, has um, seen that we do have a, a race problem in, in the United States uh, and uh, structural racism. Uh, is really um, uh, something which we need to address. So, um, and this has to do with problems with regard to housing, employment, and education. And 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 so, and we have to re- be willing to really do some of the hard things. I mean, it's one thing to I always say to to tell individuals that they have to behave better. It's another thing to tell um, governments and um, industry, that they have to behave better and that they have to really be mindful about how they create opportunities and, and deny other people opportunities and because those things have implications which result in disparities in, in health. Yeah, profound disparities, even to the point of life and death. Oh, absolutely. This, these, these are not, this is not just about, you know, sort of, uh, a few dollars here and there. Um, there's a a, a, a um, 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 there's some literature that that demonstrates that the wealth gap in 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 America really um, has a f- f- profound in, in impact on both life opportunities as well as as mortality. Uh, and and if you sort of compare people of similar wealth, you don't see some of the, the disparities that we see. Um, uh, but then we also know that the wealth of, of a black family is probably one eighth, uh, one tenth of a white family. And and um, and those kinds of disparities uh, are, have real meaning with regard to one's health and well-being in in in, in this country. Well, um, thank you so much for joining me. The report describes a enormous problem in the United States, but it does uh, provide some ideas and kind of a set of um, explanations and analysis that provides a starting place uh, to make our country healthier and and uh, close some of these uh, gaps that are so terrible. Uh, So, Professor Gaskin, thank you so much for joining me to talk it through. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. And I would would hope that anyone that reads the press release for this thing, that that alarm bells would just go off in their head uh, because this problem is not going away. 
and and uh, it requires um, um, really everyone's attention to it if we're going to to change these numbers. There's no reason why people in um, other wealthy countries should be living longer than than we are. Um, and and that gap between us and them just become greater. Uh, so um, so I, I hope that uh, that people really take this report seriously. Me too, absolutely. Thanks again. You're welcome. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, CN Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outland. Social media support from Brenda Hagader, Grace Holes-Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.